Amen. Let us turn in our Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 4, as we are coming to the conclusion. Uh, next week, we will conclude on this message, this fantastic verse-by-verse look uh, through this book, and we are going to begin this morning in Ruth, chapter 4. You've often heard me say uh, that God redeems so that we may redeem the world around us. He has redeemed to redeem. And this morning, we get a glimpse into how God goes from one Redeemer that we have seen, the kinsman Redeemer of Boaz, to another Redeemer, and how He uses these people for redemption. And through this, we're able to get a glimpse into the brevity of our lives that are often marked by moments in which we too have the ability and the calling to be a redeeming people. We have been in this book for eight weeks, and we have one more left. What an experience that it has been to journey through this ordinary life of Ruth and to be able to glean and glimpse on God's extraordinary work in the midst of that ordinary life. And that's been really the point of the whole series. How do we see an extraordinary God do things through an ordinary situation? And they have been dealing with very ordinary things. They've been dealing with hunger and famine and uh, eating and sorrow and grief and joy and work and dealing with confusion and how do we deal with some of the things of life. And that's what we are beginning to see. And this morning, we're going to continue as we look at a Redeemer born. A Redeemer born. Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. I will read through verse 16. Ruth chapter 4, 13 through 16. This is the word of the Lord. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. And then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. And may His name become famous in Israel. May He also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. Wow. Let us pray. Our gracious God and King, we are so thankful this morning. Thankful because, uh, God, we have journeyed through this story journey through a story full of oftentimes bitterness and struggle and death. And now we come to the point of the story of life and uh, wedding and marriage and all the things that bring about in this little passage. But Father, we would do well to remember the context, to remember the meta narrative, to remember the larger story. That the Redeemer of this world, our God, our Savior, our Lord, who has promised to us a Messiah, our kinsman Redeemer, has come and brought us through some of the things that we have seen so that we too may have redemption and hope. So Jesus, I pray that through this message that you will be lifted up, that your name would be manifest, that your people would worship you, and that, Father, if there is one who who is here who does not know you, that they would come to know you as their Redeemer before it's eternally too late. God, draw us to Yourself. May we hear it from Your Word this morning. May we as a sinful people, a broken people, a needing people, come to You, the One who is able to redeem and restore. And Father, may we find it in Your Son. For it's in Jesus' name and for His sake we pray these things. And all God's people said, Amen. So we're going to begin here in verse 13. And as I have titled in our outline here, we're going to go through three things. Very briefly, you're going to have the birth, and then you're going to see the blessing, and then we will get to the last part of the, um, I forgot what it was, the bonding. Jeez. The birth, the blessing, and the bonding. Here, Boaz, the Bible says, Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. I'll never forget, about three years ago, I was 
cornered, if you will, and I don't want to make it sound like it was a notorious reality, but it was, it was a reality. I was cornered and somebody, a group of people had stopped me and asked me the question, why I don't preach on things in politics more? Why I don't preach on things in politics more? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't really know the, the question that you're asking. Well, you know, Pastor, there are things that are going on in this world and you ought to preach to those things because this is the world we live in. And I'll never forget the answer, and I'm quite amazed that God, by His grace and mercy, gave me the answer He gave me. And I said, because I believe that preaching verse by verse through the Bible will ultimately bring these things to pass. That you don't have to go into the, every topic that this world is bringing because then you're going to find yourself at the whim of whatever is going on in this world. Instead, we allow the Bible to be the Bible, God's Word to be God's Word, and we allow the direction of God's Word to take us there. And look, in this very simple verse, in verse 13, we are dead set, head-on collision, if you will, with our current culture. We are in a dead-on collision with, if you will, with some of the things in our day and age that have become so, so political, so difficult to, for us to meander around and for us to deal with, even as believers, even as Christians, as you begin to see the church confused even in where we should be. Even the church struggles with concepts that we are going to talk about this morning. And here we are dealing with the idea of marriage. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. For those who declare that the Scriptures as a revelation of God Himself, we are reminded that we are to be a people who reflect and demonstrate so that the people around us may, be, may see that we are a people where our faith works. Where our faith works. What we say we believe is how then therefore we are to behave. And what we saw here in this passage, we saw the hearts of Boaz and Ruth as love and desire began to flourish and it began to be planted into a relationship. And last week we saw that Boaz, he publicly announces his desire to take Ruth as his wife. And what does he say? He promises to take care of her. He promises to to tech, protect her. And actually what he says is he, he calls for some of the elders in the community to now come together as what? As witnesses to what is happening. I want to call you around to remind you that this is what I'm going to do. This is my promise. And I'm going to now make public what has been happening privately. And this is what I want to do this morning as we even begin to uh, look at this. I want to remind us that biblical marriage is a communal event. It's a community event. Biblical marriage is meant for the community of God's people to be a part of. I'm not insinuating here, by the way, let me be clear, because I thought about this as I was stating this. I am not insinuating that marriages that have been performed privately, if you had a private marriage, that you are any less married than those who have been publicly married. Okay, You are as married as those who have been pr publicly married. And, and, and I'm not stating that, uh, that, that, that there not, may not be extenuating circumstances for some people to be married privately. Okay? Um, I'm thinking of somebody who may want to get married and they're hospitalized and uh, the only way for them to, uh, to proclaim their marriage or to be married is not to have a public ceremony but to have a private one. So, so make sure that I'm clear here in the boundaries in which I'm creating. What I am saying is that the expression of marriage is best displayed publicly in the means of community. Uh, just this very week, I was in a premarital counseling session, and I was talking about the way in which I order marriage ceremonies. And I reminded them that I have three charges in the midst of my ceremony. And the first charge is to the community. I charge the community, I charge the witnesses, I charge the people who are there to remind them that they are not spectators of the marriage, they are engaged, involved in the marriage. 
what these two people are going to do before you, this man and this woman are going to do before you, is they're going to make a public proclamation of the reality that God has called them to be together, and now they are going to be together for the rest of their lives. So if you are invited to a marriage, you are a part of that marriage. This answers a lot of ambiguous questions. Should I go to this marriage? Should I go to that marriage? You are a part of that. You have to hold them accountable to the promises and the covenant they made before God together. This is very important. This is very important. The second charge that I make is to the moms and the dads. I actually get the mom and the dad of the groom and the bride to please stand. And I make I, I do some pretty language here, but it basically means this is a new couple. Get out of their business. Right? You, mom, you're no longer involved in, in his business. You, dad, you, mom, you are no longer involved in her business. They are a new family. If they want your business, if they want you in their business, they're going to invite you in their business. Otherwise, you need to get out. This is a new family unit is what I'm basically saying. Now, y'all know my heart here. It doesn't mean that you don't pray for them. It doesn't mean that you don't give good influence. You don't give good advice. All that kind of stuff that likes to be targeted at me. That's not what I'm saying. I am. Y'all know what I'm saying. I'm talking about the mothers, the mother-in-laws on both sides who like to get involved and tell people what to do and how to do it. You need to shut up and sit back. And you need to realize this is a new family. Shut up, sit back, and let them be a new family. And all God's children said, Amen. And the third charge I give is to the couple, that as they stand before a thrice holy God, and they give a, com a commandment to God that God will not honor a marriage in which has not been uh, holy unto Him, and that they may need to be reminded of that. And I charge them before their witnesses before them. Is there any reason why they should not be married? Is there any reason that they know they should not be married? For if it is, you better speak now because God will not honor a marriage that has been brought together in an unholy way. So as witnesses were reminded of the vows that they make and the covenant promises they make and the testimony they shared, and then it's all of our, it's all of our responsibility when we witness a marriage to do what? Hold them accountable to that. And by the way, this is why, I know I might get some feedback on this, it's okay, I'm used to that. This is why I believe eloping is not the best display of a Christian marriage. And eloping should be discouraged despite what dads may entice their daughters to do. Because it's usually the dads of the daughter who says, listen, listen to me. If you will just go and do this, I'll give you $5,000. $5,000 cash, boom. Just go off and get married. Don't have their big hoorah-rah. Dads don't do that. That's not a beautiful display of Christian marriage. Now, will I agree with you that marriage has gotten off the chain? Absolutely. Just like birthdays. We do stuff that is just crazy. $100,000 weddings. That's crazy. You don't need all that. You don't have to have all that. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses. Because remember, your wedding is your wedding. Your wedding is your commitment to God before a great cloud of witnesses that you're making a covenant with one another. Okay, y'all aren't hearing me, but that is the absolute truth because that's the way I feel. I have two daughters. I would much rather just give them about five grand and say, please, just make this happen quickly and get done with it, right? But I also know that the best display of a Christian marriage is before a cloud of people, before a witness, because we are all a part of it. Let us don't lose the joy. Let us don't lose the beauty. Marriage is a mutual, affectionate display privately. Listen to this. Marriage is a mutual affection displayed privately, a covenant commitment displayed publicly, and then a personal communion displayed sexually. Did you get that? Let me go through it again so you got it. It's a mutual affection displayed privately. I care for you. I care for you. It's a covenant commitment displayed publicly as in marriage. And then it's a personal communion displayed sexually. It's, and, and we should never get those three out of order. Because when you start getting those three out of order is when you start having problems. Men, you don't want to, uh, to, to, to express yourself publicly to a woman who doesn't love you. You might be the bad thing, right? You've seen this happen. Will you marry me? No. Stand up. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that just happened. Right? You want to make sure privately that y'all have this relationship, right? 
That's a private thing. But then you display it in community. You display it in a, in a ser- ceremony, a service where people can be a part. And then you personally, you intimately commune with one another sexually. And that's what the Bible says. It says, Ruth becomes his wife and he went into her. Now, we live in a society where discretion is also often disregarded as primitive. Discretion is regarded as primitive. And I love the writer here. He gives us enough, but he leaves enough out. Ladies and gentlemen, not everything has to be described. Not everything has to be put on display. I'll never forget... Uh, we live in a we even marriage seminar. Shay and I went to a marriage seminar, and it bore the banner of Christ. It's a Christian marriage seminar, but boy, it wasn't very discreet. There were some there were some things that were said in this seminar that could have been it could have been reserved all for a laugh. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you want a comedian, you've come to the wrong place. If you want an entertainer, I'm not that good of an entertainer. And what we have got to be clear of in Christianity is that we are, I'll never forget, I preached on sex here. And and, and I remember people telling me, it's the first time I've ever heard a pastor preach on sex. And I'll never forget in my mind as I was preparing the sermon. I I want to be as biblically... as, as biblically accurate as I could be. I want to engage biblically with this. But I want to do it with discretion. I want to have the discussion, but I want to be discreet in the process. And here we discover a process for us. We have a personal desire, a public witness, and a physical union. A public desire, a public witness, and a physical union. So does this not bring for us some very near and dear conversations to where our culture is today? From marriage to homosexuality to sex outside of marriage. It brings us right. It brings us right to the core. And do you realize, I don't know if to gender, I don't know if you realize this, But do you realize that every attack Satan is trying today against the church roots itself back in Genesis? Chapters 1, 2, and 3. And typically, I mean from gender to sex to marriage, all rooted in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. And generally, how does does one come and they can create confusion? Usually it's through these words. Did God really say? Did God really say? Does the Bible really mean? And to that I say, I remind you that that was Satan's ploy in Genesis 3 to Adam and Eve. Did God really say? Is that what He really meant? So let me provide some some clarity as we begin to engage and look. And some of you may be in this very room, in this very place, dealing with your sexuality, dealing with gender, dealing with marriage, and you're looking at all this in culture, and you're going, Pastor, how do I even deal with this? Pastor, how do I deal with myself? How do I deal with my own situation and what I'm dealing with? And here is where we are. Ladies and gentlemen, sex for the believer is sacred. Sex for the believer is sacred. And, and if that is true, if sex is sacred, and it's only to be experienced in the boundaries by which God made it for, which is marriage, a biblical marriage, a, 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 a man and a woman together for eternity, <laughs> for not eternity, but for life, for, together for life, for as long as they both shall live. Because see, it's not that what we are against, it's what we are for. Because we believe sex is sacred. And by sacred, we mean that God, it has been given to us by God. We are, it is here for His purposes, not our prerogative. We don't get to redefine the purposes of the Creator. The Creator tells us why He did what He did. And if you think about the beauty of what He did, think about this. Just spend a moment. 
When you look at Genesis and you begin to read, it says he created this and it was good. He created this and it was good. He created this and it was good. And then when he comes to his penultimate creation, which is man, he said what? This is very good. And now remind you what I said in the beginning. The very first sentence that I said here is what God wants. When God chooses to redeem us, He wants to use us for redemption. When God chose to create man, He then allowed man. Listen, it, He already showed He could create a man out of clay and He could create a woman out of ribs. He could have done it all Himself. But instead of that, He decided to allow men and women to be involved in the creation process. He let us be involved in it. He could have continued creating out of clay. He could have continued creating out of ribs. He could continue blowing. But no, 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 no. He decided that the way in which in his sovereign providential plan was to let you and me be involved. And think about this, man. It just it makes it all so, so beautiful. And then he says, so how am I going to do this? And I'm pretty sure he didn't question himself. But he goes, so how would God do this? He decided in his, in his sovereign plan that Sex would be the means through which we would get to participate in the creation of a new human being. You wonder why it's so good? It ought to be what? Very good. Because this is very good. We get to participate. So sex has, sex has multiple purposes. Number one, it's to, it's to procreate, it's to have children. Number two, it's to unify, it's to commune, it's to bring together a man and a woman in a holy marriage so that they are now made one. And it's to continue that communion with one another. So for me as a believer, listen, the reason that I hold the, the worldview that I do is because of the way I view the world and the way God has shown me. Sex is sacred. God created sex. Therefore, I can no more celebrate a sexual union outside of a biblical, monogamous, heterosexual marriage than I can celebrate racism. Why? Because I think race is sacred. I don't think you got to choose your race, white people. Black people, brown people. I don't think you got to choose it. I think God determined your boundaries and your habitations. Race is sacred. Therefore, we ought, to, we ought to say that is a beautiful thing. God made you. He put you where He wanted you. He gave you the parents He wanted you to have. And by that, I don't think we ought to discriminate against that. And I think the same thing with sexuality. We didn't get to choose our race, and we don't get to choose sex. Sex is sacred. Race is sacred. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, gender is sacred. Gender is sacred. Now, here, here's, here's typically where it goes. And I guarantee you I'm going to hear about this. Then what happens is they decide to use the abnormal to define the normal. Well, what about those people who are, who are born without sexual organs? Well, first, we call that a deformity. And we don't define the deformity out of deformity. We deal with the deformity, the physical reality of the deformity. Something, something has happened physically. I have an idea that this world is broken. But we would never define what is right by what is wrong. We define what is wrong by what is right. So what we say is this is way God has intended it to be. And there are so many different uh, 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 situations and circumstances we can deal with. But we start dealing with the one, the minuscule issues and we miss that there's a bigger picture here. And it's this, that sex is sacred. And as most of you know, our missional community is very diverse. We have people from all walks of life and beliefs sojourning together. And oftentimes, I'm asked very hard, very personal questions. Very hard, very personal questions. And I was asked within the last few months, almost a year now really, so you're telling me in order to be a believer, I have to stop doing or being, that's usually the words that are there, and I'm going to leave it blank. And the reason I'm going to leave it blank is because I don't care what you put in there. Did you understand that, faith family? I don't care what you put in there. 
Because whatever you put in there, it's going to have the same response. So the individual came to me and says, so you're telling me in order to be a believer, I have to stop being bop, bop, whatever that is, blank. I said no. Some of you are already confused. You're going, what? I said no. I said, listen to me very carefully. If that was all there is, then belief in Christ would merely be a partial solution to an eternal problem. If all I have to do to be a Christian is stop doing or being this, then all I have to do is stop or being that, and then I can be called a Christian. And But church, that's the way we've made Christianity. You need to stop doing or, believe, or doing or being this. No. I said this. I said to follow Christ is not giving up that thing, whatever that thing is. Following Christ is to give up everything. And the problem... Dear sister, and I told her this, I said, the problem, dear sister, is we have watered down the gospel so much that we believe that you can have behavior modification, and we have a lot of people sitting in the chairs, sitting in the pews that have given up that thing, and now they're a Christian where they have not given up everything. Jesus said to be my disciple is to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. To the rich young ruler, he said, sell all you have and give it to the poor. The fox have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you willing willing to hate your mother and your father and to follow me? Do you understand this, church? We don't get to pick and choose. Listen, we do it in the pew. What we get ticked off at people publicly, politically about, we do it in the pew every day. And then we cover it. With Christianese. Well, that's just my personality. No, it's not. You're, you're mean. Well, that's just who I am. No, it's not. Jesus has redeemed you. He's redeemed who you are. Now He's made you a new creature in Christ Jesus. I think the reason we're so confused in the church today is because so many people have given up this or that and now think they're Christian and they have lost it. They forgot that I had to give up everything. 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 Jesus, whatever I have, it is yours. Whatever you need, whatever you want, it is yours. I follow you and you alone with the rest of my life. See, following Christ is not behavior modification. Following Christ is rebirth. It's the Spirit of God indwelling us so that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we have been set free to obey and follow Him. However, the message of following Christ is less about what we have have to give up. And it's much more about what we have to gain. It's good news. You see, this is what I went into secondly. I said, first, it's not giving up this or that. It's giving up everything to follow Him. But I want to tell you, you are missing it. You are allowing, you are allowing the, the thing, whatever this thing is, you are allowing it to become your idol, to become your God, because you want it more than you do Jesus. Can I tell you what you get? Can I actually turn what you see as bad news into good news? Can I show you what you get? You get Jesus. You get the eternal Son of God dying on a cross, paying for your sin. You get justification. You get to be made right before God. You get sanctification. You get God's Spirit indwelling you. You get eternal life with Him. And yes, 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 you get heaven. But I don't want to tell you about heaven. Because if Jesus ain't there, I don't want to go to heaven. The only reason I want to go to heaven is because that's where my Jesus is. And what we've done in the church is we made heaven seem like that's where we want to be. And none of you want to be with Jesus. How do I know that? Now, I could be totally judgmental here and wrong. How do I know none of you want to be with Jesus? Let's look back at your week. How many of you wanted to be with Jesus this week? Pastor, I really, I just can't find time. I can't, I can't find time. 
Well, God help you when you get to heaven. Whatever your heaven is. For some of you, your heaven is defined by what you want it to be. You've created a heaven in your mind. There's clouds. You're walking on clouds. And there's this, there's this gate. And there's this, there's this sea. And there's all the, you've created this, all, the, all this stuff in your mind. And you forgot that the, that the purpose of heaven is to be where God is. So it's good news. For Jesus came as a propitiation, a payment for our sins. He died for all so that we might live, so that we might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. So I said to her, no, it's much more than just giving up this or that. Jesus demands all of you. But in that, you get all of Him. And she said this, and I love her honesty. It's hard to get church people to be honest. Why? Because they have so much Christian ease. Because to admit that you are struggling with something seems to be less Christian. Where God knows what you're struggling with, I don't know why we've done that. It's weird. It's weird. It's just weird. And this is what she said. She said this, and I quote, Well, we are talking... uh, Hold on. She said... Well, we are talking more than just this part of my life then, aren't we? Unquote. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, we are. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know where you are in this place. But I can promise you this. My struggle may not be your struggle, but I still have a struggle. Yet I am His and He is mine and I will live the rest of my life according to the way He has called me. Regardless of my proclivities. Did you hear me? I'm going to follow Him for the rest of my life regardless of my proclivities. It's crazy. In our culture, if I don't live according to my faith, I'm deemed a hypocrite. But if I do live according to my faith, I'm deemed a bigot. So let's stop allowing the culture to define who we are and be God's people. My hope is that I would be faithful to live out my life according to God's will, regardless of what those around me who may accuse me of. That I may be able to give a defense of the hope that others see in me. And as both of these young ladies who I had this conversation with would confirm, that despite our differences, we've never stopped loving them. All right, I'm moving on. What is indicated here is the is what is declared in the Scripture. It's that the purposes of sex are realized and united a man and a woman in the bonds of marriage for both duty and pleasure and to conceive children. By the way, it reads here, listen, this is another huge idea that I got out of this passage. It reads, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. Did you read that? The Lord enabled her to receive and she gave birth to a son. By the way, it's the same Lord that brought Ruth out of the land of Moab, made her a childless widow, and it has now enabled her to conceive. Oh, that we would resolve ourselves in the providence of God, that no matter the dissonance, no matter the problem of our lives, no matter if, if the sun is shining on us or if the clouds are over our heads, that no matter the dissonance that is created in our minds, we would not abandon His rule and His reign in our lives. The Bible says the Lord enabled her to receive. And ladies and gentlemen, it's no different today. No different. And you know what? Here's what what the young mind comes and tells me. Oh, pastor, that's just religious jargon. We know what happens with conception. Doctors, did you know this? Science has ruled out the need of God in conception. Science has ruled it out. I mean, doctors can come in and, and, you know, doctors can uh, 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 fertilize eggs. It's not the Lord. And I would say to this, yes. Matter of fact, there's a child in this faith family that is the very byproduct of this amazing ministry of mercy where doctors are able to fertilize eggs. But let me tell you something. We are speaking of different descriptions of cause. We are speaking of different descriptions of cause. One is agency, 
and the other is mechanic. One is agency, and the other is mechanically. I want to illustrate this simply, if you will, if you'll just be patient with me. If you were to ask me, why did I have a drink of coffee today? Why did I drink a cup of coffee today? How did I get that cup of coffee? Well, the first, question, first answer I could say is because two, oxygen and a hydrogen, two hydrogens and an oxygen mixed with the elements of the coffee and due to the heat uh, that caused the elements to do what elements do chemically, it caused this reaction and the chemical reaction along with the sugar and along with the milk, it caused a chemical reaction creating me coffee. Would I be wrong? No. That's exactly what happened. But why did I want coffee? Because I was thirsty and I wanted coffee. You see that? The agent didn't change the mechanics no more than the mechanics changed the agent. It's a different reality of cause. When we say the Lord enabled her to conceive, it is the hand of God's guiding providence to use the mechanism of physical union to bring about conception. So for us at one, listen, so this brings up another hot topic. I'm telling you, this, this, this one little verse, I know y'all are going, he's getting all this out of this verse, yes. So for us, when does human life begin? The moment conception takes place. When does conception take place? The moment human life begins. At conception, human genes are present. And it may take time to develop the mechanical. But at the point of conception, we are in the presence of a human being. And it is a gift from God. And it is sacred. And because it is sacred, it ought to be what? Protected. Regardless of my proclivities. If for us every conception is a gift from God and not a mere collection of atoms, then we are bound to give that life every possible chance to live. And many, many people will look at me and go, How, who are we to tell a woman what to do with her body? I'm not telling a woman what to do with her body. I'm telling us what to do with the body inside the woman. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it's very important that we sit there and we lay, we say, that's life. And we do everything in our power to protect that. Many of our unbelieving friends are actually logically consistent in their belief, though. If life is merely a random event and eventually we die and nothing, then all of life is irrelevant. So what does a few days, a few weeks, or heck, even a few years mean? We can do away with life however we want to do away with it. It has no meaning anyway. It's up to me and what I want to determine what life is. Isn't it crazy today that we don't know, by scientific definition, we don't know when life begins. So instead of saying, because we don't know when life begins, we ought to go to the beginning we pick an arbitrary date. God help us. God have mercy on us. The millions of children that have been aborted. No, we hold that, er that all of life is a gift from God and to be tra treated with inherent value and honor and dignity and respect. And by the way, that's honor, dignity, and respect for the born and the unborn. Did you hear me? We ought to treat every life with honor, dignity, and respect. Born and unborn. It's messed up in our world when we want to treat some lives as though they don't matter and then other lives as though they do. But yet you want to talk about abortion and you could get the church on your side quick. You want to talk about racism and it becomes weird. No, we, we value all of life. We value all of life. All right, we go from the birth to the blessing. Verses 14 and 15. Why do all the women pause and turn to Naomi? Did you ever get that? Watch, it says, Then the women said to Naomi, Wait, who had the baby? 
you would, you would sit there and think that everybody would talk to Ruth. But they all started talking to Naomi. As a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, Ruth will not be mentioned for the remainder of the book. I wonder if there's something greater. I wonder if some, God's doing something in His providence. I wonder if next week we're going to get into that. I have a sneaky suspicion that we just might do that. By the way, the last time we heard from these women were when? Chapter 1, verse 19. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them, and the women said, Is this Naomi? And now we have the women back. And now they are bringing her a blessing. And what did Naomi say at the beginning? Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Why? Because Mara translates as what? Bitter. Hey, look at this in the providence of God's hand. She went from being a bitter woman to being a blessed woman. And what is this blessing? First, a blessing rooted in the grace of God's provision, providence, perseverance, and presence. Blessed in the Lord. Blessed, blessed in the Lord, who has not left you without a Redeemer today. Who is this Redeemer? Many people say it's Boaz, but I don't think it is. Why? Because verse 15 says, May he also be a restorer of life and sustainer of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons and given birth to who? To him. To who? To the Redeemer. To the Restorer. The baby is now the Redeemer in the, in the message. The Redeemer now is this child. Boaz has come to redeem. This child has come to redeem. And then these women prayed that, this, that his name, this Redeemer's name would become famous in all of Israel. That his name would be, would be called or be remembered, would be known. Not only in this child, but not only, I'm sorry, not only is this child to be a redeemer for her, but he's also to restore her life. It is the idea that this baby is to, going to give her new life, going to redeem her, going to renew her. And I will tell you, if you've been around these situations where, a, where an elderly lady has lost a loved one and then she has a baby in her arms, there is a newness, there is a refreshing spirit, there is, oh my gosh, there is hope. She things begin to change. This whole idea of looking on the past and what we've lost is still true. But yet now there is a newness of life. There is, a, there is something going on in the future. There is a renewed hope. And they also say this child is sustain or nourish you in your old age. There is something that new life does to us. And there is more here that, will, that time will not allow me to preach, but I didn't want you to miss it. So you can, I'm going to give it to you so you can go study. How does a life recover from broken and bitterness? How does a life recover from brokenness and bitterness? Through redemption and restoration. And then they say this, the women. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons who has given birth to him. What a picture of love. This little girl who left all that she knew, all of her family, all of her gods, she committed her love. In chapter 1 we read it, and here the Lord through His providence and provision has blessed Naomi from bitterness to blessed all through the means of redemption. And then lastly, I couldn't help it, the sentimental side kind of got me here. Verse 16, we see the bonding. Naomi takes the child and lays him in her lap or in her bosom, and she becomes his nurse. There would be a descendant from this child who would write this in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your distresses, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Let us remember that all we see here is laid on the backdrop of the deep sorrow and emptiness that has now turned into radiant joy and fullness. The reality that once life has been born, she will now take it 
and make it her own with the utmost care and attention. Because let me assure you of this, that in the backdrop of loss like Naomi has experienced comes an appreciation for life that can only be known through the pain. And it is in this that you and I are reminded of our own redemption, are we not? Our own need. Our own need for redemption is much greater than mere posterity. In other words, our need for hope is much more than merely having children. But it isn't it amazing that we are coming upon a season in which it would be through the birth of a baby that we would be able to be redeemed also. See, Jesus is a better Boaz and Jesus is a better baby. I know that's hard for some of you to deal with because you know your babies are perfect, right? You're, especially those grandbabies. But Jesus was the best baby because this baby came he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Instead, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The redemption that we need is of our fallenness to God due to sin. We are able to believe that we have not been left without one who has come to restore, redeem, and sustain us. One in whom we are able to what? Like Naomi, a child has been born. A child has died, a child has come, a redeemer has been, uh, redemption has been brought with a price, and now our redeemer, what are we able to do like Naomi? We who were once in bitterness are now able to be blessed, and we can hold dear the one who has come to redeem and restore us. The beauty that in another baby we found our redemption, because the Bible says, for God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son so that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Here we are in Ruth chapter 4 speaking to very contemporary issues, are we not? Speaking to the very reality of life as we see it today. Would you ever think that we would be where we are today in the midst of confusion. But all the confusion only reminds me. All the darkness only reminds me of the need of light. And the darker it gets, the more beautiful the Redeemer becomes. Will you please stand to your feet? May we spend some time thinking through this message. Some of you may be here and maybe you've had an abortion. Maybe you're listening by video and, or Facebook and you've dealt with abortion. You've dealt with these things. And the shame and the guilt that is upon you is heavy. I want you to know that God has come to redeem you. In Jesus our Lord, that you can find redemption for your past sins. Remember what I said, no matter what this or that is. That we have one in Christ that has come to pay for our sins and to restore and redeem us. So that church, we don't have to walk out of here in guilt and shame and fear. We can walk out of here knowing that we have been redeemed by our Savior. And by the way, just for the record, Many of you may be in here and through the message preached, you can go, you know what? I don't know why I'm looking forward to heaven. I don't like being with Jesus now. Why would I want to be with Him then? That's a very legitimate question. But I would ask the Holy Spirit of God to deal with your heart. Maybe you're in here and you're like the three youths that I baptized today and you come to this place in your life where you say, hey, I, I, for the first time in my life, I don't care how long you've been involved in church life, I don't care where your membership resides, whatever that may mean, 
I don't care about all that. What I care about is maybe today is the day that the Lord has made that you have found. Today is the day of salvation for you. That today is the day that you have finally discovered that, you know what? I have not given my all. He's right. I've, I've merely accepted some of the things of Jesus. I've not given my all. I'm ready to, I'm ready to all in. All in, Pastor. I'm giving God my all. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting in Him. The Holy Spirit has convicted me of my sin. The Father is drawing me to His Son through the Holy Spirit, and now I want to be saved. If that is you, then I say, come. Come. Follow through in baptism. Make your inward repentance an outward reflection. And then for those of us who have believed, we have the privilege today to believe in the Lord's Supper. And to trust in the Lord's Supper. And to remind ourselves is what does the Lord's Supper represent for us? The body and the blood of our Redeemer. So as we gather for the Lord's Supper in our missional communities today, I'm going to ask you something. Missional community leaders, as they gather, ask about how, how the Lord's Supper points to our blessed hope. Because of all that He's done for us. Let's spend a few moments in our own quiet time reflecting on the message that has been preached before we respond in the Lord's Supper and in communion and in giving. Let us reflect on this. Let us repent and believe in a better Jesus. Amen. Let us pray.